Undertale is a game with some good songs and funny skeletons. That's what I thought it was until July 11th of this year, nearly five years after its initial release. I was wrong. Undertale is a game that has already impacted me to an insane degree. Since completing my first playthrough of the game, it's been on my mind, constantly forcing its way to the forefront of my psyche, as if calling to me. I've noticed myself seeing flashes of character sprites in my head, vividly remembering moving moments that take place in the game, and humming along to music that isn't even playing. I've lost sleep trying to put all the pieces of this puzzle together. It might sound like I'm going insane, and maybe I am, but this is how I get when I experience something like Undertale. So this isn't just an Undertale video, oh no. This right here is a fucking therapy session so that I can reflect on what I've experienced. I'll attempt to structure this into a somewhat digestible format for you, but there will probably be a few instances of unhinged rambling, so please bear with me. Since Undertale released five years ago, I was lucky enough to have very little of the game spoiled for me. Despite its immense popularity and, admittedly, thunderous fanbase, this first playthrough was almost completely blind, and after the fact, I have to say I'm so happy that I never spoiled this one. Undertale's story is experienced through your own choices. Almost everyone who picks up this game will journey through the neutral route first, and in my opinion, the neutral route story offers the most basic plot of all the three main plots. But there's still a ton of information here, mostly about the basic lore of the Undertale universe, that of its history between monsters and humans. Your playable character has fallen into the underground, which houses the very monsters humans had banished long ago. Your goal is to escape the underground while surviving the various monster encounters you will have throughout your adventure. However, the journey between the beginning and end of the story is entirely based on your choices. Do you fight? Do you have mercy? Who is good and who is evil? These are all decisions you have to make, and each battle you fight will affect the outcome of your journey. Now, at a base level, the neutral story isn't all that complicated. Your only goal is to survive and escape the underground, but along the way, you'll get to meet so many eccentric characters and learn more about the world around you. The first thing that jumped out to me is how Undertale handles its character writing. For me, I find that some RPGs struggle in this department. It's hard to get invested into a story and world of a game if you don't care about anything that happens to its characters. Undertale doesn't have this problem, because these are some of the most genuine encounters I've ever experienced in a video game before. Each time you come across someone in this game, it feels like interacting with a real person. They're unique, they have these varying personalities, they have their own quirks and desires, and despite that, they all fit together beautifully and invoke all sorts of emotions within us, the player. And the writing has so much charm and wit that skipping dialogue isn't even a thought that occurred to me. I actually forgot you could do it until my second playthrough. What? Flirting? So you finally reveal your ultimate feelings, yeah. Well, I'm a skeleton with very high standards. I can make spaghetti, actually. Oh no! You're meeting all my standards! Obviously, you can point to the game's humor as a benchmark for good writing, and it's something that certainly drew me in. I love these encounters because they gave me a sense of comfort, which is something that you're actively searching for without even realizing it. The underground is actually such a meek existence. Your entire goal revolves around escaping it, but at the same time, these short bursts of solace from the harsh reality you and everyone else is facing are so lighthearted and quaint that you can forget about that, even if it's just for a moment. But also, these fun encounters are perfectly set up to completely throw you for a loop. The history of Monsters and Humans is a main focus of the neutral story, not only to get a general idea of what happened between Monsters and Humans, but also how it has affected each character. Undertale is a game about people. People just trying to get by in a depressing existence, holding on to hope that you are actively trying to destroy. 
Oh yeah, in your quest to escape the underground, you're fighting against Asgore, sure, but also the dreams of the very monsters you get to know during your adventure. It puts you in this moral dilemma. There's a quiet sadness hanging over every part of the story. From an outside perspective, you're just progressing through a game, but Undertale fully immerses you in its universe, and that is something truly special. When a game with skeletons making fart jokes can make you question your real-life morals, you know the writing is good. But when does Undertale go from a fun game with a solid narrative to something truly special? Well, I suppose we should start at the end. It's the end. You've defeated Metaton, and it's finally time to leave the underground. Before you access the final elevator, Alphys informs you that you must kill Asgore and take his soul to escape. There's no option for peace. It's kill or be killed, remember? You're conflicted, but determined. As you approach the castle, it's dead quiet. The anticipation of the battle is palpable. The journey is almost over. Just one more battle. Just one more fight. Just one more kill. If only it could be that simple. The music starts back up. It's a soft tune, one that resonates with you. As you walk through this house, the monsters you've met surround you. They tell you about the one called Asgore about his wife and child, about the first human who fell into the underground, the human he helped save, the human who became like his own child, and the human who died. Then the monsters explain that the humans attacked Asgore's son for bringing the human's body to the surface. He returned to the underground on the brink of death and collapsed, his dust spreading across his father's garden. The king had just lost two children in a single night. Now, you must kill him. How? How are you supposed to fight this guy? The humans killed his son just because he was a monster. You can't fight him, there's no way, how can you? In the end, Asgore makes the choice for you. This sequence is one of the most brilliant in any form of media I've ever experienced. The music, the buildup, and the way it unfolds just blew me away. I was actually dead silent until the final fight started. Not only is Asgore's past beyond tragic, but he's also completely reluctant to fight you. He doesn't want to kill you. He doesn't want to take another soul, but it's too late. He's already thrown away his morality for the sake of his people. He takes the mercy option away because he knows he doesn't deserve to be spared by a human. I mean, he's killed six of them at this point, why should he expect forgiveness? Like I said earlier, this is a story about people. And although Asgore is your villain impeding your progress, he's also a person with a family and dreams that were taken from him, and now he must kill to free his people from their imprisonment. It's gut-wrenching, and it's amazing. Not to be lost in all this is the final Sans encounter. Right before this battle, you meet Sans before the throne room where he proceeds to pass judgment on you. Your every action, every XP you earned, and the number of LV you have. He judges you for them. These stats aren't just a number to measure your health and attack and defense. These are a part of you. Undertale doesn't just break the fourth wall, it includes it as part of the narrative. You made these decisions. You killed those monsters. It all falls back on the player. It gives you some time to truly reflect and ask yourself if this is the outcome you wanted. And it absolutely makes you want to give it another go and make everyone happy. But for now, the game throws you a bone because you can actually spare Asgore after you fight him. No, you can't leave the underground. But at this point, that's not so bad. You've met some incredible people, made friends, and come to understand this monster society. So... Sure, Asgore. Let's become a family.
That's it? The game just closes? That's the end? Oh. oh whoa. Whoa. What the fuck? So, this is where shit gets next level. Remember how I said Undertale includes the fourth wall in its narrative? Yeah, well, the real reason I said that is because of Flowey. He kills Asgore, crashes your game, destroys your save file, and becomes a god in the span of like, two minutes? It's actually surreal. An in-game character has the power to save and reset the game. That's a fourth wall break on another level. like. If there was a fifth wall, I think this would be it. Oh yeah, uh, then you have to fight him. Ah! Ah, no! No, 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 stop, 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 stop! How do I fight him? I'm gonna die! He's dropping nukes on my ass! Oh. This flower is the most evil villain of all time! Flowey basically traps you in a never-ending cycle that you can't escape from, simply because killing you over and over again is fun, and is the only way he can feel anything. This is a nightmare. Just listen to the music. Oh, and just to reiterate the fact that you have absolutely no chance against him, your first attack hits him for 1 HP. It's all just a bad dream. But then the music shifts. It's not over. There's still hope. There's still a way to beat him. There's got to be. But then it shifts again. Flowey quickly suppresses that hope. It's gone. Into the void it goes. It's impossible to win. You are going to die. Then again, it shifts. No, it's not over. This battle is like a tug of war of your own willpower. Your resolve will be tested. You'll get hurt, beaten down to within an inch of your life. But you summon the courage to fight against the inevitable. Until finally, the other human souls come together to help you. They've been watching. They've seen your bravery. They've seen your determination. And they want to give you the power to win this battle. Now, it's go time. Nah, just kidding. The other souls rebel and Flowey gets yeeted. It's over. This battle is a prime example of how Undertale can tell its story. Undertale can tell its story through its fantastic dialogue. Undertale can tell its story through its gorgeous visuals. And Undertale can tell its story through music. But also, that's just one ending. Yeah, there are still two more. How do you top that? Well, like this.
A second playthrough of Undertale is when shit gets real. Or, I guess, more real. It's different for everyone, but you're going to start to notice that something's off. Because Undertale remembers. Wait. Why are you looking at me like that? Like you have seen a ghost. Come on, man. There's... Oh, my God. This game remembers. Resetting can only do so much, you see. For the most part, your previous actions will be wiped out. But some things are unforgettable. This adds a brand new element to the plot of Undertale because, as we found out in the neutral ending, resetting isn't just an in-game function. It's an integral power that certain characters possess. But now more characters seem to remember you, and it's something you have to think about. Who knows what? Is everyone who they say they are? These mysteries keep you on edge and guessing where the plot could go. But trust me when I say, you won't be ready for what happens. One of my favorite parts of the pacifist route is the characters. In neutral playthroughs, you'll get to know them at a basic level, but in pacifist, you have to complete certain events to change the overall story, which pretty much means you have to sign up for an eHarmony account because it's time to start dating. You can go on dates with Papyrus, Undyne, Alphys, and even Sans. Twice. And these dates paint a whole new picture of these characters. Through these dates, you really start to establish an intricate connection with these guys, and it's not just the main characters either. Every character in Undertale is important in their own way. Besides the dates, the story progression follows the neutral ending quite closely. You go through the core, new home, and finally the throne room before taking on Asgore, and then eventually Flowey to complete the game. A call from Sans later, and the credits roll. You might be thinking, really? That's all there is? Of course not, silly! This is Undertale! The next time you open the game, Flowey will greet you if you spared him in your pacifist run, and he'll tell you that there's a way to save everyone. All you have to do is go visit Alfie's lab instead of fighting Asgore. Once you start heading back, you'll get a call from Undyne who tells you to meet up with her to get a letter for Alfie's. When you bring the letter to Alfie's, she mistakenly believes the letter is from you, and this is where the Alfie's date takes place. Funnily enough, I actually didn't do it this way. On a whim, I decided to go check on Papyrus and Undyne after defeating Metaton, and I got the call from Undyne then. Granted, I had already completed a neutral playthrough, but I never actually saw Flowey's message, and I never spared Flowey either. Sorry for the tangent, I just found that interesting. Anyways, on the Alfie's date, you find out that Alfie's and Undyne like each other, but Alfie's lack of confidence in herself and her anxieties are preventing her from telling Undyne about her feelings. She admits to you that she's been lying to Undyne about herself, to make herself seem like a better person and she questions if it would be better to keep up the lies if both of them could be happy. But in the end, she relents and decides to tell Undyne the truth, and Undyne fully supports her, and even hires a life coach to help her. It, it's Papyrus. Personally, I couldn't think of a better choice. I mean, the guy can make spaghetti, what else do you need? This is such an uplifting scene because we, the player, can sympathize with a lot of Alfie's problems. We all have our similar struggles in life with these kind of emotions. We've all doubted ourselves. We've hidden the truth from others. We've wanted those kinds of connections with people. And once we've had them, we've wanted to preserve them. That's just what it means to be human. But we can get through life if we have people around us who love us. That's why this scene, this moment, resonates so much with all of us. And it's just another reason why Undertale is more than just a game. And as you move toward your destiny, you have the knowledge that your friends... Yeah, so in case you couldn't tell, things don't go as smoothly as you probably thought they would. Alfie's has a lot of baggage, and it's not just about how seaweed isn't actually that scientifically important. There's a lot to unpack here, and it all happens at the True Lab. Experiments once took place here, and boy were they just the coolest. 
You know how there's a box of text that says you're filled with determination whenever you save the game? Well, that's not just a motivational message used to entice the player to continue on. Nope, this determination is actually the power that keeps human souls from disappearing after a human dies. It's the power that allows you to save and reset your game. It is literally the most important plot element in the whole game, and you aren't even supposed to know about it until after your second playthrough, and yet it's just there all the time. It's right there in front of you every time you reach a save point. Toby Fox just dangles the most crucial detail of the entire Undertale universe right in front of you for at least 10 hours of playtime, but he doesn't let you reach that conclusion until you've been a good Samaritan. What a legend. Oh, and these determination experiments that Alfie's conducted, right? She injected monster souls with this determination only to have those souls dismantle and then reassemble as amalgamations of their previous forms that live in constant anguish. And in some cases, these monsters were taken away from their families to be experimented on, with their families living blissfully unaware of the suffering those monsters have gone through. But not only is determination the reason why human souls are so strong, not only are monsters being experimented on, but on top of that, Alfie's conducts determination experiments on vessels that have no souls at all. Entry number 15. Seems like this research was a dead end, but at least we got a happy ending out of it, question mark. I sent the souls back to Asgore, returned the vessel to his garden. I called... Yep! Flowey was the result of Alfie's determination experiments. These revolutions blew my fucking mind and really started to put the puzzle pieces all together. The true lab is basically just a huge exposition dump. And yet it's probably the best area in the whole game because the information you're given here is just that engaging. My eyes were glued to the screen and I really didn't talk that much. I was too anxious and unsettled by the bleak atmosphere here. It was actually scarier than most horror games I've played and the contrasting tones of the end of the Alfie's date, which was so spirited and uplifting, to the quiet dread that enveloped the True Lab, absolutely threw me. This, the True Lab, is at the top of the list of reasons why I think Undertale is a masterpiece. I'll finish this section by saying that I was just not okay after this, but it's not over yet. We still have to leave the underground. We still have to break the barrier. We still have to kill Asgore. Psych! Goat Mom comes in with the fattest clutch and stops the fight before it can start. Then all the people you've gotten to know and become friends with come too. And although you won't be able to leave the underground yet, it'll be okay because you have your friends, your family to support you. Come on! So yeah, Flowey not only absorbs the six human souls, but also every single monster soul too, and becomes... a goat? Wait, what? <laughs> if you're Asriel, then that means that Flowey was Asriel the whole... time. Asriel, now with all of these souls, says he doesn't care about destroying this world anymore, and that he just wants to reset everything again. Maybe that's the best way. Maybe it's the only way to escape the underground. Maybe it's pointless to fight back. But this isn't just about you anymore. Even if it seems impossible, there's just too much at stake to give up now. I think I like this fight so much because you win through the power of friendship. And when I say that, I mean it literally. It's not like one of those things where your attack gets stronger because you want to save your friends. 
No, you actually win the fight by saving your friends. It turns the power of friendship cliche on its head, and instead of taking it away, it challenges it directly by making the friendship itself the win condition. That's just... genius. After saving your friends, you are also able to save Azriel, who explains that he didn't want to have to say goodbye to you, even though he knows you aren't the original human. That's why he wanted to reset the timeline, so that he wouldn't die and he could keep himself entertained to try and suppress the fact that he couldn't feel any emotion. But he gives that up once he sees your, or I guess I should say, Frisk's kindness. Knowing he'll eventually disappear, he releases all the monster souls while also breaking the barrier so that everyone can go free at last. Even though he won't be able to be with you anymore, because he can feel again, he understands that the other's happiness is more important. This is a powerful moment. And it made me cry like a baby back bitch. Everyone gets their souls back, they meet up at the surface, and that is the true ending of Undertale. Time to reset everything and murder everyone! Yeah, the pacifist playthrough is cool, I guess, but it lacks murder and violence, and that's just unrealistic. So instead, let's do the complete opposite and literally kill everyone. A genocide run of Undertale is far more simple to explain. The title lays it out there pretty on point. You kill everyone. Not just a few people, not just most people, every single person. And this changes the game drastically. For the most part, a neutral and pacifist playthrough are pretty similar besides the ending. This isn't so in Genocide. You are a merciless, killing machine. You feel no joy in anything else. It's so different. The game recognizes that you are not only killing people, but actively seeking every single person to annihilate everybody. The music takes on this warped, low-pitched tone. Towns are now barren. No one remains. They are all trying to escape. Sure, they are monsters in name, but the only real monster is you. The story changes too. There are lore reveals, of course, but I'm talking about how the characters act toward you. None of them, not a single character, treats you as a human. They acknowledge you as something else. They don't know what you should be classified as. Two people in particular recognize exactly what you are, though. Toriel and Flowey. You play as the first human, the original. Kara. Sort of. This is a little confusing and kind of in the theory territory, but basically when Frisk falls down into the underground, Kara's spirit latches onto Frisk and is seemingly awakened in the genocide run. There is also the possibility that Kara is there in the other pathways as well, but Frisk has to fight her off, but that's just speculation. It doesn't really matter. The important part is that both Toriel and Flowey recognize the presence of Kara in the genocide run. And that's because Kara isn't all that great of a person. I believe it's in the pacifist ending that Asriel admits to knowing this already. Kara's goal was to break the barrier of the underground, but it's assumed that it's because Kara hated humans and wanted to start another war between them and the monsters. I don't know, it's left vague on purpose. Anyways, back to what I was saying earlier. Many of the characters do not recognize Frisk as a human. They also change their actions as well. Sans isn't present for most of the story. He's there in the beginning like he always is, but it's pretty clear that Frisk isn't here to play around with him and Papyrus, so he disappears. Alphys alters her actions too. She attempts to save any monsters she can before Frisk can kill them, perhaps using the true lab to do so. Undyne pursues Frisk as per usual, but this time she steps in to save Monster Kid from getting murdered. Yes, you attempt to kill Monster Kid. After all, it's just a little free XP, right? You seem to kill Undyne in one hit at first, but she just refuses to scatter into dust, and this is an instance of a monster actually using Determination. It's implied that some monsters can use Determination, but it never really ends well. See Alfie's Determination experiments for proof of that. However, Undyne powers up into a super badass and will wreck your life if you aren't ready for it. She's essentially the Undertale version of a shonen protagonist, the only difference being that she can't win. Oh my god, it's so fast. There's no way. There's no way I'll live. Oh my god, please. Just stop. Okay. This should be it. Yeah! Yes! Yes! Oh my god. 
Now I gotta feel bad because I fucking beat the hero. The Undying Encounter in Genocide is great, but the one that affected me the most was... Papyrus. Yeah, Papyrus. I know, right? Since when did he become so important? Now I'm not saying he wasn't ever integral to the story, but in other playthroughs he's seen more as the goofy comic relief character. He still had story significance, of course, but much less so than Asgore and Asriel and Alphys and alliteration. But here, Papyrus is what sets the tone. His hilarious quips, his wacky puzzle ideas, the bouncy beat of his boss theme, they're all gone. This isn't fun. It's not supposed to be fun anymore. But what really got me was when it was time to finish him off. When it was time to kill Papyrus. Even after seeing you murder so many people. After seeing the fear you instilled in his friends. Even after striking him down. Papyrus, breathing his last breath, says that he still believes in you. Chills. That hurts. That really does hurt. Before the Asgore fight, you will once again enter New Home. But this time, there are no monsters to greet you. After all, it would be kind of hard for them to do that when they're all dead. <laughs> However, there is someone here. A certain golden flower. Flowey meets up with you and starts explaining a little more about himself and why he acts the way he does. He says that he awoke in the garden and was greeted by Asgore, but found that he was unable to feel any love or affection. No matter how hard he tried, he couldn't feel anything at all. He tried visiting his mother Toriel, he tried befriending the monsters in the underground, but nothing worked. And because of that, he felt that there was no point to life anymore. He tried to kill himself, but his determination kicked in, and instead, he discovered his ability to reset. He kept trying and resetting but he still couldn't feel any emotion. Eventually, he got bored and decided to start killing monsters to see what would change. He became twisted and murderous because he found killing monsters more entertaining than befriending them, and obviously he didn't feel any moral obligation to keep them alive. It's a tragic existence. But finally, seeing Kara return, Flowey had some motivation in life, which was to accompany Kara. But Flowey made a crucial mistake when he stopped lying to himself. He's scared of us! Flowey realizes that Kara isn't interested in teaming up. No. Kara just wants to kill. It doesn't matter if they were friends at one point. Kara is truly evil. And when Flowey realizes this, he gets scared. That's right. Kara is so evil that Flowey, the determination vessel who can't feel anything, Flowey gets terrified. Wow. That's really all I can say at this point. But it still isn't over yet. Because first, you need to have a bad time. Sans is the most interesting character in this game to me because of the genocide run. It's hinted at in other playthroughs that something's different about him than other monsters. And in this moment, it becomes clear that Sans can remember things from different timelines. He remembers things even after a reset occurs. It's not known why he is the only one that has this ability, but the fact is, he has it. And he's tried to use his knowledge to fix the timeline. He's attempted to beat Flowey and let time progress as it should, but in the end, he couldn't change anything. He didn't have enough determination to overcome Flowey's power. All he can do now is to try and stop you from killing everyone and everything. And he does so by absolutely beating your ass. Instead of taking the reset time and change everything approach, Sans decides to defeat you by playing mind games. Basically, he understands that you can reset as much as you want and that he can't stop that. 
So instead, he decides to try and force you to lose hope and give up by destroying you hundreds upon thousands of times. He tries to outlast your will. He looks through the game, directly at the player, and says, Fine, you want to play this way? Then you're going to have to go through me. He's betting on the fact that his boss fight is too hard for you to beat, and that you will give up. Which of course, gave me even more determination to beat him. It took seven hours of total game time, but I did it. Most health I've ever had! Let's go! With Sans dead, Asgore is child's play. A one-hit death finishes him off. Now, finally, Kara shows herself to you, thanking you for your hard work. And then she takes your soul. So congrats on killing everyone. You get nothing. As it should be. And that's it. Sure. There are a bunch of neutral runs you can do with slightly different endings, as well as special soulless runs that have different endings, but the three stories I've talked about are the ones that are the most important. I want to end this video with a thank you. Thank you, Toby Fox. You have inspired many, many people through your game. Undertale has touched the hearts and minds of so many of us, and I'm definitely a part of that group now. Yes. I may have waited five years before experiencing this masterpiece, but I've experienced it now. So maybe, just maybe, maybe that's okay. That was awesome.